This is at Swan, Swan Island Dahlia Farm, and it's my favorite type of Dahlia called Junkyard Dog. <laughs> and I'm getting in tight. I don't even remember 180 macro or 100. And using a bullseye composition off, to, I'm sorry, a non bullseye composition with this flower center off to the left. And then carefully changing my perspective until I can get a little wash of color from background junkyard dogs. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how beautiful your subject is. If you include some of the background, that background has to be really beautiful also. You don't want to put a beautiful subject up against a nasty background. So one of the biggest problems that I see um, are people don't understand when to stop down and when not to. So when I fill the frame with the whole flower, that's when I'll stop down because I don't need to worry about pulling in distracting backgrounds. I'll shoot more wide open when I want my backgrounds to look soft and beautiful. So, you know, doing something like this where you're focusing here and allowing it to be, you know, softly focused in the background. If he had shot that at F22 and you saw every one of those little ugh. lines, ugh, it's a different picture. So be mindful of your backgrounds and understand how they affect your image. So for this image, I shot, um, this sunflower like a high key look. So you can see that the background is slightly blown here, but it opened up the entire center by shooting, exposing, remember, expose all the way to the right, and I used a reflector to push the light back into the center. And so for me, on a triangle like this, you know, I'm not too worried about that or here. It still has a nice flow, and you definitely are drawn right here. 100 macro? Yes. I'm using a Canon 5D Mark III and 100 uh, millimeter macro. I'm working in manual mode and I'm using manual focus almost exclusively for my photography with flowers. Okay, so, and again, love the lines. So that's for me is what's really important. I try to look for a nice flow. Using the backgrounds, again, Arthur just showed his picture and this is something I would do and everybody's like, oh, where do you focus with that? Well, I don't really care about the stem. Is that really that pretty? No. But this area is beautiful, right? And the colors are beautiful. Anytime you can find a heart in nature, something that you want to do, you know? Sometimes they're not obvious and they don't rush right out at you. Now here's one where I've stopped down considerably for this hibiscus, and I did this because a client asked me to. She lost her son, and her husband had this hibiscus um, named after her. So she said, "Can you, you know, I want to photo, I want you to photograph this, and I want to put it over my mantle, and blah blah blah." But I want the whole. My husband doesn't understand art, so I want the whole thing sharp. From to me, it's you know still art. <laughs> um, and a beautiful anemone. So sometimes I like things centered if they're balanced. I'm not opposed to having things centered. Sometimes I like a square composition. For bird photography, I try to avoid square compositions because right away your eye is telling your brain it's been cropped. So I like to, if you know how I photograph birds in flight, I want everything to fill the frame. I want it as big as I can get it, and I want people to know that I didn't crop it. So if I cut it into a square crop, you right away, your brain would be telling you something's wrong. But with flowers and creative stuff, it's okay because it, it, it becomes more like a piece of art and it doesn't matter. So with my regular bird um, photography or, or landscapes, I'm not really cropping into uh, squares, but for flowers, I'm fine with that. And you see a flower with um, a petal that's missing, and you know that's an open window to see the inside. Don't just say, "Oh, it's it's broken. Let's keep moving on." So I look for things like that. Working with different apertures, Arthur. It's a beautiful. We were cosmo. up. Thank you. Doing where we just came from, Old Car City in White Georgia, and there was a Cosmo field just up one exit. And I like long lenses, so I had the uh, 200 to 400 with, an, uh, with, an with the internal teleconverter. And then I put another converter on so I could get to the single blossom in the middle of the, uh, the field and isolate it and soften up the background from, at 784 millimeters. Yeah, so if you find yourself somewhere and you say, well, oh, I really love that flower, it's beautiful. Hey but um, I don't have a macro lens, I can't photograph it. Well, that's not exactly true. 
So Arthur has been seen in Kuchenhof with a 600 millimeter lens <coughs> and stopping traffic. <laughs> and he's made a lot of friends, too. There I am, and you all mentioned Kuchenhof with a 600 lens with a 1.4 teleconverter. Again, using that uh, three degree angle of view to narrow down the background, avoid a million flowers, and pick the background that I want. And then the final piece to the puzzle was how high to be. If I get too high, I get green. If I get too low, I get stuff in the background. Pick the right perspective. And I love one of my favorite tulip pictures. And you saw a similar picture of Denise's with the 100 macro. Now, when I asked her what lens did I use, I knew this was coming. Because similar composition, similar results. This is the 600 and the 2x <laughs> at f11. So lots of ways to skin the cats. It's funny, too, f11, look, the fall off. Fall off at the edges. Yeah. More Kuchenhof with this with the 100 macro. Uh, what do they call them things? Orchids. The orchids, yes. <laughs> so we went to the orchid pavilion, and I like to work really tight. And one of the coolest things, I don't think we have this picture in the show. Maybe we do. But we, we both went into the orchid gallery at different times. And later, when we were looking at each other's pictures, I don't know if she saw mine or I saw hers, but she said, oh my god, I made the same exact picture. It was from the back of an orchid showing these green things with the white stripes. And everyone who was in the group was amazed and going, oh my god, how could they make the same picture and they didn't even talk to each other? And I said what I always say. There are principles of composition and design that make a good photograph. And once you study them and you look at a million good pictures, Stuff like that jumps out at you. So it jumped out of both of us and landed on both of us. Next. It's been funny if it was the next picture. <laughs> it's not in here. Long lens again, 200 to 400. Isolating a flower in the middle of the pack that sticks above, and then choosing to include a little bit. This is an aberrant sunflower with the orange rust brown as opposed to the normal one next. Yeah, and I like his little inclusion of that because it tells you a little bit about what's going on, that there's other flowers there, and they're probably <coughs> sunflowers. So I like that. This is mine. I'm shooting um, completely different where I'm not thinking about the whole flower, but I want to include the regular sunflowers in the back so that you know that they're there. And I shot this at a 5.6. This dahlia, I just, I think this is a new picture for me. I just loved it. I loved everything about it. I pointed it out to several of my clients. I said, oh, please photograph that. Just photograph that. I love that. <laughs> and then I decided on the last day when everybody had gone, I would just go ahead and take my own picture. So I loved it. And for me, this was just pretty. It just had that pretty pink and green. I just love the colors. I love the background. And I wanted as much of that background as I could get. I used to do a lot of flowers with long lenses before I met Denise. And then I started working with the 180 macro. And then seeing all of her beautiful stuff, I bought the 100 macro, the IS version, which she eventually got. And here I am working on a tripod, just really, really close to the flower, off-centered composition, and pretty, pretty good amount of depth of field. Yeah, I used to have the older 100 macro. And I wasn't going to upgrade because I shoot really close up. And that image stabilization wasn't really the technology that was going to help me. So I thought, why should I pay for it? Why should I upgrade? I don't need to. And then I dropped my macro lens face down on the counter, <laughs> smash. And I thought, well, if I'm going to buy it now, now it would be stupid not to buy it without the image stabilization. So I did. It wasn't because I thought I, I was going to get a better lens. OK, exposure and lighting. When a lot of clients show up on instructional photo tours or creative adventure workshops or ones we do together, they go, oh, man, it's cloudy. And Denise and I are going, oh, man, it's cloudy. <laughs> yes, we can photograph all day with no shadows. And 
This is uh, Naples Botanic Garden, and it's some kind of uh, oriental lily, and it's in the middle of the pond. So I have my 600 and a 1.4 or 2x, taking advantage of the soft light, the still conditions, and adding probably a stop, a stop, and a third to the exposure next. Look at how beautiful this back is right up here at the top. Isn't that just gorgeous? Yeah, and I love that reflection and all the detail we got there. Really nice, sir. And again, you have the little corner element, as we saw in the sunflower one, that spices things up. Sometimes you don't have nothing. Yeah, knowing your gear is really the most important thing that you can really have in your, in your toolbox, is knowing what you have, knowing how to use it, and knowing the limitations, because that can really be very useful. Most people just think, oh, I'll just buy the new lens or the new camera, and that'll fix everything. So this is a rose that um, I photographed in the center, really pulled me in, and I loved it. So I wanted to put it, compose it so it was off-center, but you know, with a white flower, for me, I wanted to make sure that you could see all the different layers, but I didn't want them to be what you know stood out. I wanted the center, so I really, again, directing your, the viewer's eye with my sharpness. Classic rule of thirds. Yeah. More long lenses, Dahlia Farm, early morning light, again, I think 784, 200 to 400 at 400, internal teleconverter, external teleconverter. And I believe this is with sunlight, and I think the next frame, same flower holding a diffuser over it. So There's if you go back up front. in the full sun, and I actually like the softer version. Now, why does the background look so much lighter? Because I needed to give the flower way more exposure since it was now in the shade of the diffuser and that light in the background. But I like the look. I like the lack of shadows in the, in the shaded version. Yeah, and that can be really interesting when you're doing flowers. And that's one of the, the assignments that I give my clients is I want you to photograph the flower in the shade and the background in the light. And then we reverse that later your flower in the light and the background in the shade. And that can be a lot of fun. And they learn so much about exposure and the way that it can really affect an image. So you know, we do that with the use of our reflectors and diffusers. And we also use some of the reflectors as sun blockers. You know? So we keep and the we blocker. also use people as sun blockers. Yes, and <laughs> even ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, so it, the great thing about flower photography is you can, for the most part, control the light on a lot of the situations. Not everyone, but a lot of the situations you can control the light. And it's much easier than if you were out there photographing a bird. You couldn't go up to a bird with a reflector and hold it. Although I am thinking about creating a vest that has a reflective front that you could. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, and then it could pull up, you know, and have be wired so that I could pull it up while I'm laying down. When you work with something like um, with flowers like tulips, I love to shoot them backlit. I love to use them um, to put between me and the light source so that they can just be like illuminated uh, globes. They're just beautiful. And these are all from Kuchenhoff. And you see the specular highlights. You see the, the rim lighting here. I just love that. So, you know, just because it's the opposite of where the sun, where you think you should be photographing, it doesn't mean it is. Here's another situation, same kind of thing, and just looking for the light. I love this. This was, um, it looked like a flame, so having that light and making it look illuminated was even more special. Backsides, I love backsides of flowers. So there's a lot of interest in the backside of a flower. And again, the same compositional rules, you know, rules apply. I don't want to stick this dead center, but see how it is like right up here? That just gives you all of that to look at. And a, a poppy, you know. At Longwood Gardens, I do workshops there, and sometimes whoever plants the, um, they plant the uh, Himalayan blue poppies for display, and they plant them so that they're facing everybody that's going to walk in the little pathway, and that looks great. And the windows are over in the back, and then after the first, you know, heads fall off, and then the buds. The buds turn and say, hey, the window's right there. Mm -hmm. And then so now all the flowers are facing away from the people. And everybody, um, you can't walk into the, the garden bed to photograph. You can't put your tripod leg in it. And everybody is doing this and trying to get unstable shots. And I'm looking at them like, are you crazy? 
shoot the back of the flower. How beautiful is that? So I'd rather put it on a tripod when there's not a, a lot of light in the um, conservatory and photograph a, a, a better picture. So I do like to hand hold a lot, but I, I know my limitations. So if I don't get a you know sharp picture. This is an F28. And for me, I love this area, but if I'm shooting an F28 and I, fo and I focus there, this is going to be so out of focus, that's not going to look good. So you kind of have to decide where do you want to put your focus. General rule. You want, you want to focus on the closest thing to you. If you have a bird photograph and the bird's on a beautiful perch and there's a branch protruding this side of the bird and you properly focus on the bird, it's going to be an image wrecker. So you don't want to have a lot of out of focus stuff on this side of the plane of focus. Yeah, and, and that said, there's here. a lot of times you want to break those rules. You just have to know when you can. And mostly the way you're going to know when you can is just keep doing it and, and bringing those pictures home and looking on the computer and saying, aha, that really works. Even though I thought it maybe it wouldn't, it really does. But you know, don't not take the picture, but also consider taking it a different way. Yeah, those are beautiful. So this was at the Rose Garden. This is handheld. Yeah, I would have loved to have had a tripod, but I didn't. I had everything packed, and I was just going to go through the garden real quick and take some quick shots to just you know show everybody what we were doing. And I saw this, and I went, ah! <laughs> it was beautiful. It was soaking wet. It was just dripping with water. And I, I took the best shot that I could. And I, shot, I framed this in a square because I thought it looked, it looked better. Like that one. Yeah, and so, you know, a Gerber, a Daisy, and it just looks like a fan, like, of lights, rays of light. And the same flower, but a little bit different. So you, just because you're shooting a backside doesn't mean you necessarily have to shoot this or this. You just be creative, so. Selective focus, one of my favorite things to do. So what is selective focus? exactly what it's, it says. I'm selecting a place where I want to focus. So for me, I'm focusing here and I'm using a shallow depth of field. So this is probably a 2.8 and look at how nice and blurred the rest of it is. For me, I like to work really tight for these type of shots. I think it's more effective. I think if you get too many lines and things going on and they tend to start to look like just blurs. Most of them go back. Most important part of the picture that you're not going to even notice unless you're thinking is the, her treatment of the upper left corner. That beautiful grouping of five little anthers, she's given that a border. Yeah. And that sets up the whole picture. If she clips those, it's a trash. And so just looking for interesting things when you're doing selective focus, like the edges. And this is why I'm always using manual focus. If I was in auto focus and I tried to focus on just that edge, it would be really hard and it would just take the camera so long. I just don't have time to play around with it. You don't need it. I usually set up um, you know, one shot and then I put it into um, manual focus and then that way I get the beep as soon as I acquire focus so I don't, I'm not actually doing it by guesswork. I mean, I hear the beep and I know I've got focus and Okay, again, selective focus on just these little guys and letting the rest, you can tell it's a daisy, you know it's a daisy. Do you need to see every little bit about it? No. The inside of a rose, I put, um, one of the assignments that I had for my last year's group was, we're gonna go into the rose garden, the roses are already spent for the season. Oh, but why are we gonna go there to photograph? Because we're gonna learn how to photograph a rose that's already spent. But why do we want to do that? Because you can still create beautiful pictures. Because someday you're going to be going to Kukinoff Gardens and you're going to get to the conservatory and everything in there is blown open wide and it's done with. And you're, you don't want to come home without a picture. So there are reasons. So I worked really tight here and just went on the inside, got really close. And every single one of my clients said, I didn't see that. I said, well, you weren't looking close enough. So working tight when you have you know, some dead flowers or even accentuating the dead lines can be really interesting. For this, these were so important for me that they needed to be the center of it. Now, if I focused here, these would have been softer. And it really wasn't about the center of the flower. It was about these petals. That's what drew me in. So that's where I focused. Same here. I mean, 
Do I care if you see that sharply focused? No, but these were just beautiful. So you're directing the eye with focus as much as you are with color and light. This is a 2-8 and, you know, using another flower in the background is always a good thing if you can. Yeah, so, you know, this shot looks really easy, and it's really not. <laughs> you get to the garden, and you're like, if you're working on a tripod, which is one of my pet peeves, if I'm on a you know, tripod, I can't really finagle. But if you just take your camera off of your tripod for a while and find the background, and then you can say, oh, I need to have my tripod right here. That will help you, because otherwise, you're going to sit with your tripod and spend a half an hour trying to find a background that's pleasing and it's just so much easier taking it off of the tripod first. 600 lens, teleconverter, 1.4, I'm sorry, 1.4 teleconverter and a 50 millimeter extension tube. When we first got to Kuchenhof, the last time we went, everything in the conservancy was done. The tulips were falling down and everybody went, oh my god, this is terrible, we missed the peak of bloom go, yeah, but you have a window into these amazing shots, and it was one of my most fam favorite trips. How far away were you on that? 15 feet, 14 and a half, big lens. <laughs> Same idea with the 180 macro now, looking down into the flower. And you know, every photograph here speaks to the creative vision of the photographer. You go into the Kuchenhof, and there's like 4,000 tulips of 200 different varieties. And your job is to go in and make some sort of order out of chaos. And how do you do that? By seeing and looking for patterns and shapes. What's the light and source? What's the light source on that? The light source in Kuchenhof, there's a big opa semi-opaque windows, like in a greenhouse. So it's just n diffused natural light, yeah, diffused no flash or anything. Light. Yeah, I don't, did, I don't use flash. Do you use flash at all? I don't think I've ever used flash on a flower. I like to use reflectors instead. So you know, if you go into somewhere like Kuchenhof or Longwood Gardens, it's really hard sometimes to pull out those big flash uh, reflectors. I carry the little 12 inch ones in my pocket and then I can just it, pop it out really quick, especially if you're working tight. And enough, if you um, are by yourself working, you're going to say, well, I can't really hold the camera. And then, yeah, okay, but you have a tripod, you have a timer, <laughs> you set it up and then you just, you know, <clears> put, the, put the reflectors. Another the note here on. was getting my 180 macro in a position where the top of the pistol yeah. was on the same plane as the closest anthers, so that I kill two, two, three, and then two, and then two. Yeah. The, certainly the middle one and the, uh, the top of the green stalk are on the same plane when that added power. If I had been lower or higher, that wouldn't have happened. So picking the angle in to parallel the subject next. Same deal with, I think this one was with the 600 also. So they're big tulips teleconverter, extension tube, focusing manually. And my flower technique is different than Denise's. I mean, we do things totally different. I'm working in AV mode all the time. She's working in manual. Once I frame this shot, and I figure the exposure plus 2 thirds, it's not going to matter if I shoot it at f4 or f22. The exposure is going to be plus 2 thirds. So my thinking is, why change? have to change two things when I can change one? Then I go to mirror lock and two second timer. And I sit there and I go boom, F4, boom, F8, boom, F11, F16, F22, done. Which do I like best? Maybe take two of each in case somebody knocked into my tripod. This one I'm super proud of because I listen to Denise who says, you can number one, you, with if hand holding 100 macro, you can get into a lot of places you can't get with a tripod. And two, this technique of putting one shot autofocus, and as I'm breathing and not standing still, as still as she can stand, if you half press the shutter button, 
when, it, when you hit the plane of focus, it'll beep. So here I had a, a lower AF point pick, and I waited till I heard beep at the bottom, and boom, boom. So it's almost like exposure, like focus bracketing, you know, with manual focus because I can't stand still, and I couldn't get a tripod in there, and then got one that I love next. Same exact technique. This 100 macro, an inch and a half from the sunflower, just listening for the beep or even looking at it when the part you want comes in focus. High key flowers. I love high key everything. <laughs> so photographing the dahlia up against the sky and again, exposing to the right. The background is going to blink if you have your highlights enabled. And that's OK, as long as you don't get anything blinking on your subject. Once you get anything blinking on your subject, it's just going to be a hole. And then it's just going to be a mess. And you don't want to do that. So you have to be very careful. Take your shot and check your, the back of your camera, everything really carefully. There you go. That's what it's going to look like if you bring it into Lightroom. Uh, I don't like to trust the back of my camera. I don't, I don't look at it. I'll trust the histogram. You, you trust that. Absolutely. Don't, don't trust the, the LCD screen just going by what it looks like on the back of this, the screen. Um, I don't like mm. that. I also enable my RGB histogram so that I can keep an eye on the red channel, especially with flowers. Um, especially if you're shooting red flowers or shooting in the early morning. I'm not going to expose just for the red channel because a lot of times you'll have to really grossly underexpose the entire image to not get any clippings. But I also use my reflectors um, as blockers to shade some of those red flowers and that just cools off that channel right away so it'll be a lot easier. Because a lot of times you get, you know, especially with Canon, you get some of those reds and somebody's looking at the brightness histogram and they don't even notice that they've got anything clipped and it's not showing on their highlight alerts. And then their red channel's up against the wall and they bring it into to, uh, ACR and it's like, ah, it's a big saturated mess. So sometimes I'll just cool that channel off by, you know, by shading it. So here's a high key um, sunflower. And I'm really proud of this. I sold this for a lot of money. <laughs> so I was very happy. Um, and then he bought another print, so woohoo. Uh, but he, what he liked about it was the, um, he, what he said was he liked the softness of the petals and that the way that they look like he could see through them. So, and that was just from, you know, the exposure. Okay, so as photographers, a lot of times what we do is we tend to tell, and you can probably look here better, we tend to tell the whole story by just, you know, getting everything in the frame and showing the whole flower and whatever. For me, I like to leave a little to the imagination. So what, for me, I wanted to see this teeny, teeny, tiny bit of daisy and then the flow of the petals and wanted them to fade into the background. And I wanted it to be something that you actually looked at for a second and said, Oh yeah, that's a daisy. But I didn't want it to be blaring in your face. So a lot of times you tend to photograph things because you want people to see what they are. But sometimes an abstract or something with a, a portion of the flower can be more interesting. So it's not, for me, it's not important to get every little bit of the flower. I'm more about the feel. And a daisy is a very simple flower. And trying to photograph it in a way that it hasn't been photographed is hard. But for me, just showing a little teeny bit and putting it a small thing in the corner worked really well. And I also like a botanical look. So I thought that this had a um, kind of an Audubon look to it. So I used um, my you know, high key exposure thing where my background is a couple little blinking pixels, but nothing on the subject. And I actually looked for a flower with a, with a bud, which is really hard to find in a, in a, um, that's free uh, you know, in a field like that, because everything is. And then here's my rendition. I actually liked it by itself. Arthur's was nice, too. But this, this side over here looks much better. Light pad photography, I love it. Um, it's a lot of fun. I've always used, in my house, my uh, studio, is um, a sliding glass door and a, a little table. And what I do is I use that glass um, as my light pad. So what I would do is I would tape a flower to it, and I would photograph it. And I really liked the way that came out. But then I got 
all these little dead petals of a hydrangea once and I couldn't put them all on there. And I thought, gee, I need something that's going to illuminate from the bottom. And I started, you know, searching through Google and I came up with a light pad and I said, ha. So I wrote Artograph a letter and told them I'm interested in this and would they like to sponsor some of my workshops? And they said, yes, we're on board. They sent me a few and um, I bought the Gistec Flashmate, which they've got better ones now that are a lot less expensive, but really I just used this because it had two dials on the back. One dial controlled the um, amount of light and the other was the temperature. And I use that sometimes I put a little extra light on top of the uh, light pad. This is one of the first ones that I photographed. So I put the hydrangea petals on there in a random fashion, and the light's coming up from the bottom, which gives me a nice clean background, and I illuminate at the top. Sometimes I'll use a reflector if I'm home. But, um, and then I used Nick Color Effects, and I put it in the tungsten uh, filter, which I liked. And then here's my business card. So same grouping of dried hydrangeas, just rearranged a little bit differently. And then I um, put a solarized filter in Nick Color Effects and created the blues and the browns. And it's now my business card. And that's with um, Topaz Simplify. Let me see if I have one here. But because I'm using the light pad, it's just being able to have that, you know, that high key look, which I love. Yeah, so they came out nice. And you can use an iris, you know. In the olden days, I would tape that to my patio window and photograph it, and you can still do that. And what people don't understand is it hangs upside down. I tape it, photograph it, and then I can turn it and photo, you know, can turn it around. You don't have to keep it upside down. And a couple of leaves, coleus leaves. And then that's what I ended up. I started off with three leaves and said, hey, I like that one. Black backgrounds, hmm. How do you get a black background without using a flash? Okay, so for me, this is probably the only time that I spot meter. So I put my black background really close to my subject and then I'll spot meter. But by doing that, that black background gets really black instead of, you know, if you kept the background farther away, it's gonna show, so you get it really close. And it's illuminated beautifully, same thing. This is in Kuchenhof. I couldn't actually do that, but to expose for the um, flower, the background was in the shade, and that's how it comes out. Arthur. The old 400 DO with a teleconverter, and that's actually natural light. And the water is a tea colored. So when I'm exposing for the white, one stop under the right exposure for uh, a middle tone, that's going to render the black background two stops under and make it look like a flash shot or something done in the studio. Um, this is a dahlia that I did a black and white effect in uh, Topaz Impression. I used the charcoal um, filter, which I loved. But you know, I back off of those filters. I don't do them at you know full intensity. So I back off so it still has a bit of natural, of a natural look to it. Interactions. So. What are interactions? I love when flowers touch. I love when you show two of them together. To me, this is like cheers. And so one, that's another theme that I give <laughs> to some of my clients when we're interaction. I want to see two flowers, two or three flowers interacting. But you know, this wasn't an accident. It took a lot of time to position myself to get those you know, colors in the background. So it's just a matter of setting it up. And when you've got a lot of stems, you want them not to touch, and if they do touch, they need to cross at a at a the right spot. They can't just be sloppy. So here we have the green, mimicked by the green, by the stem, by the stem. Just getting down low at Kuchenhof. This felt like a painting. So background flowers really can add or take away from a flower. So for me, this I loved. I would love to have a sheet. My sheets look like this. This is when I saw this, and I was like, oh, I want this. Here, the you know one of those juxtapositions with the bud, and I chose to focus on the flower 
and probably working at 2.8 or 4 with the 7200 and having the bud just this side of the bloom, which is a rare case since I just told you not to do that. But then listen to Denise who said, hey, try it. Try the different stuff. And this one and that one, for whatever reason, it just works. Okay, and going in for another um, juxtaposition, but I'm using uh, Topaz Impression and this is the um, colored pencil, and I've reduced some of that opacity. I like that. You know, when I saw this, I kind of felt like I was going to do something with it. So a lot of times I'll capture something with the thought of adding a filter to it. Patterns in Nature, I just did a, um, a workshop for Adirondacks um, Photography Institute with Patterns in Nature, and there weren't a lot of Patterns in Nature, but what we did is we created our own. So we found quite a bit. Um, but for this, one of the things that works for this kind of a shot is to be parallel to your, your subjects, okay, so you get more depth of field. But also, I look for like-sized um, leaves with this, and the bottom ones at a relatively the same distance so that everything can be kind of sharp. Some orchids. These are Vanda culture orchids, and I used to have a flower shop, and I loved them. So when I saw this, I was like, whoa. <laughs> Just filling the frame, stopping down. Here at um, Longwood Gardens, everybody thinks, oh, you used flash to get the, the water black. Well, they put dye in the water, so you don't have to do that. You don't even have to do that. Make it easy for you. <laughs> but trying to make you know, a pattern out of um, things like this is kind of hard, but you just have to be persistent and try. <laughs> These were at the grocery store, and they were, and they were like hanging off of a, a tray, and they were falling like that, and it caught my eye. So then when I got home, of course, they're not going to stay in that same position, and I'd actually fiddle with them to get them to back to that. I like that. In Kuchenhof, uh, we've done that trip a couple of times, and if you asked me whether I'd have the peak of bloom in the fields or in the conservancy, I'd want it in the fields. So there's wonderful stuff you can do. This one is probably the 200 to 400 lens and selectively focusing on the front row of flowers and then letting it fall off. Yeah, that's a really important tip, the front row of flowers, because if they're out of focus, that could really be a mess. Composing flowerscapes at the gardens in Kuchenhof, I, it was closing time, and I wanted this person to get up and leave so bad. <laughs> and I was set up saying, it's closing time. They're kicking everybody out, and including me. You have to leave. And I'm thinking, she's going to hear me. You know, This is pretty far away. She wasn't getting up. And I said, oh, crap. All right, I'll just take the picture anyway. I took the picture, and I got back to the computer. I went, wow, she made the whole scene. What was I thinking? <laughs> so yeah, like I had a brain freeze there, hoping she'd get out of the picture, and she was the whole shot. Who knew? OK, so <laughs> this is the first year. And do you see the size of those trees? The second year, I'm bringing my group back, because everybody wants to get this same shot. <laughs> I bring them there. And I'm looking all over for those trees and going, I know I'm in the right spot. I was walking around. They took them out. They took them out. They took those big trees out, and they planted these. I had to get three workers there to confirm it, because I just could not believe it. It just didn't register in my mind. Are you kidding? So these are the same place. <laughs> so this is a different shot the next year, but how do you like that? So don't expect to come back to the same location year after year and see the same shot. It's not always there. So thank god I took that picture and didn't say, oh, I'll get it next year. The lady's gone, yes. The lady's gone. There's also more light on the flowers. I could move her over, though. <laughs> she, could, she could come out in Photoshop somewhere. And so this is from across the water. And looking for a composition there, it's not as easy as it looks. But once you start to frame it out, you can start to eliminate distracting elements as you're going. So the best thing to do is frame it. Take a couple of shots, look at the back of your camera, look at the shots carefully, and say, oh, I clipped this, I moved that. And so repositioning until you get the shot you want. We had mist last year, which I was so thrilled. I had just gotten back from a workshop in Charleston. So I was really in love with that you know, 
that Charleston low country look and the draping moss. And then I saw this and I said, oh, that fog is beautiful. My clients were crying that we had fog and I was like jumping up and down for joy. <laughs> and somebody wrote me a letter, you're so lucky, I've been there seven times, I never got fog. And I thought, yay. So, yeah. The fog adds to the picture, if you ask me. And again, now this little hut thing is, you could photograph it a million ways. There's so many different shots of it. Here's one, you know, different angle. This is one of my favorites. Walk towards the end, and I just loved all the lines. Every single line was just beautiful. After I photographed it, I showed the group, and they were all like, oh, get me back there, get me back there. We walked back. One of the good things about when we go to um, a place like this, we get in early. I don't know how we do it, but we bug them, and they let us in a little bit early, and we go right to where we need to be before the crowds come. So it's if you try to do this shot at 8 o'clock, forget it. It'll be, you know, you have to just run Especially in. Especially for those across-the-lake shots you saw yeah. one or two. Yeah. Once the people get in there, you're done. Actually, across the lake shots are, are hard, too, because you still have the workers that are working, getting ready to open. And it's like sometimes you want to say, excuse me, but you can't. <laughs> so this shot, they almost always plant these um, in like a, a river. So this last year that I went, there were none in bloom. It was really early for them. So it changes every year using the pathways there. I had a woman who was in the way of the path, and I just went up to her and I said, she was standing there for quite a while, and I said, do you mind if I just take a quick shot without you in it? Oh, I didn't know I was in your shot, I'm sorry. And then we ended up talking, and I gave her a few photography tips, she was happy. <laughs> Worked out. 24 to 105 with the nice skies. Uh, maybe 70 to 200, I'm not sure. I think 24 to 105 on a, a tripod. Yeah using the diagonal lines to lead the eye next. Yeah, look at those fields, though. They're crazy. There's so many of them, too. Then same place, pointing the lens down and getting a little bit of the sky and forced to include the farm building on the upper right. Multiple exposures. Anyway, what I like to do is I like to go, it's got its mind of its own here. I like to go straight on. I take one shot straight on, and I use my center point focus. I'm hand holding. I put the center point directly in the center. I turn to like 1 o'clock on the clock, refocus, take the shot, turn left to about 11, put the center point back in the center, refocus, take the shot, and then it will put them together in a nice, beautiful, ethereal blur and a nine multiple image. One of the tricks for this is not to turn the camera at all. Straight on, every one of the shots has to be completely straight. If you turn a little bit, you'll get that twist. You know that twist that everybody gets. And here's what I call a soft sharp. And it's like an in-camera Orton where you're using the backlit flower and you're taking one really sharp shot and one totally defocused where I'm filling the entire frame with a defocused part of, you know, portion of the flower so it, the back of my screen looks like all color and that just adds a nice color wash to the whole thing so here's one where I'm turning the camera I want you to look I chose this image with a blemish right here and with a crummy background on purpose so keep an eye on where that is and the background how sloppy it is so this is my first shot my second one is defocused so I'm just taking the focusing ring and totally defocusing it my third shot, now instead of being here, the blemish has moved up. And the background's changing a little because I'm turning a little. And now my next shot, I've gone from there to there. So I'm not moving huge movements, just a little bit. And then this is what the camera will do. It will blend them together. And if you look over here, it actually looks way better. Um, it'll blend them together. And then you'll have this you know, prettier background because it softened that ugly green. And then in Photoshop, crop to a square, and I brought the center of the first flower back in so it's nice and sharp in the center. So it goes from that straight out of camera to that. And it's really easy to do. I have a tutorial on it if you, didn't, if you missed any of it. But in real life, you're not going to want to pick a flower with a blemish because, see, the blemish will keep repeating. I did that just so that you could see where we were and how I moved it. This is Arthur's. Isn't it gorgeous? That is a multiple explosion. Ex 
Yeah, a multiple explosion zoom. <laughs> where you maybe be at 200 millimeters for the first frame, you do a five frame, and then you go to 185, then you go to 170, and it builds out on five frames. And you want to be sure with Canon, where you're doing these in camera, to have your exposure set on what, average? Yes, average. And you, you will still put in your correct compensation. So this is late afternoon light. I'm going to put in plus 2 thirds. I'm going to take the five exposures, zooming out, and it comes up with the right exposure, which is a nice touch. Yeah, in Nikon, I put it on auto gain. That's me? Yeah, it's gorgeous. I'll take it if you want. I have no idea who took that, when or where. Oh, it must but be But I mine. like it. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like, go back a sec. It looks like it might be a slight movement yeah. left, right, up, and down. It does. Uh, multi. This is just that nine image on a Cosmo field, except for I went down to five images. And just holding the camera straight for each one, not turning at all. This one I turned. This was in the, see how it, you turn it a little bit and you get a little bit of movement? So this is just the tulip fields and just giving it a little turn in between each one. This is a, um, a little blur where I've got a slower shutter speed and I'm pulling up just a little on each one just to give it some drag. And this is a multiple exposure where I'm just turning the camera. So it's similar to that um, sunflower one. This is a two frame multiple exposure uh, with the 5D Mark III. And the cool part is if you work in live view, you take the first picture, it shows up sharp, and then when you move the lens, you see the, you see the effect. It's amazing. And then I said, gee, that looks nice. And that was the end. And this one is, I just went in the same direction, three in the same direction, just to give it some spin. And it's good to pick um, flowers that work well with them, and the outline of the uh, flowers worked. Same thing with this. This one, I've, it was laying on a black um, tablecloth, and I removed two of the stems, and I just turned the camera for three frames. This is a sharp soft created with the 600 and a 2X, where I took one sharp, and defocused and then brought them into Photoshop and blended them. And this is an action that I created for a single flower. So if you've taken a single flower and you want it to create that multiple exposure look, you could. So once you do go through all the steps, if you set up an action while you're doing it, you can easily just go in with a single flower, hit the, the action and let it run and get that same look. So for those of you that don't have multiple exposures, you can do that in Photoshop. And if you're going to go through the trouble of creating it, I would set it up as an action so you could do it over and over again. Texture overlays. I love to add texture overlays to flowers. I think you know you can create some beautiful art. Texture overlays are textures, and they're available online free almost everywhere. You can buy some, but um, I don't really buy them. I either create them or, or download them from uh, Shadow House Creations. This actually has a texture overlay, and it's just a subtle texture overlay just to try to um, be like a vignette around the outside. That's re really what I'm using it for here, just to soften up the outside edges. Same thing here, but I've added a painterly effect to the texture overlay. This was a lens baby. Somebody asked me if I shoot with lens baby often, and not really, but this was the um, Sweet 35, and I, I used it and took a picture, and then I kind of didn't like it, so I added a texture to it, and I like it a lot more. But yeah, and that's with um, a texture overlay. If you read my blog at all, this was um, a texture overlay with a little bit of a painterly effect added to it in Topaz Impressions. And this is a frozen uh, iris. So I lay it into a, a thin pan and I freeze it. And the freezing adds the bubbles. And then when it comes out, I take my hand, which is warm, 
and I, and I go over top of the ice and it just reveals some of the flower and you can get some great effects. You can do that with like a, bu a bunch of tulips or anything, but the key is to run your hand over the top to reveal the flowers, not to pour water. Um, and then I added a texture overlay to it as well. And then the same iris, a little deader, I waited for it to die, <laughs> warping a flower. Um, all right, so take a shot like this, and I like it, but I wish it was a vertical. I wish I had captured it in a vertical. So now I've done that. I've created a vertical. And um, warping it is just with a transform tool. I cover this in my um, in the ebook, The Art of Flower Photography. But it's basically just making the selection with the transform tool and then um, just pulling it and dragging it how, however you want. And then I add a texture overlay to finish it off. So it goes from that picture to that, which I think can be kind of fun. Here's a... Um, a dahlia that I kind of warped the crap out of. Not yet. There, now I warped it. <laughs> can be a lot of fun. You can do different things if you like. And this one I did a, um, a zoom twirl in Photoshop to a rose and added a texture overlay to it. In camera blurs, Artie and I do lots of those. Yeah, generally about a fifth to a quarter of a second handheld or on a tripod. On a tripod, you're going to get a more defined look. And just practicing pressing the shutter button while you're zooming, usually I go from lo a longer focal length to a wider focal length. It doesn't really matter. And when you first try them, you'll do the first couple, and they come out looking pretty sharp. And you go, huh? It's just a matter of timing the shutter release. And then, of course, uh, where you focus, where you point the camera, and you, the rate of turning relative to the shutter speed you've picked, but you can do some neat stuff. Yeah, and you don't really have to do the entire motion of the zoom. It doesn't have to be an entire zoom. You have to just start that motion for it to show up. Here's one that I did, and the degree of um, blur, you know, how fast you move. I went really slow for this, and the reason I did is I wanted you to see the sunflowers as they went through. If I had gone fast, you would have just saw lots of lines, and the top was all fog, so I focused on that center flower sharply focused before I start it. Yep. 600 lens, Kuchenhoff, sixth of a second, ISO 50. Could have shot at ISO 400 at F20 rather than ISO 50 at F7 or something. It's just a vertical pan blur from down to up. And with vertical pan blurs, anything that's long and skinny like trees, we're doing that. And the most important thing to understand is that when you're doing a vertical pan blur with tall, skinny subjects, the composition is determined 100% by the timing of the shutter release. So here I wanted about half green stems and about half flowers. So it's just a matter of practicing when you're pushing the shutter. And when you're doing it with a stand of trees, you generally want a clean lower edge. So you do a couple and you didn't get any lower edge. You know you're releasing the shutter too late. Then you do a couple and the bottom of the trees come out in the middle and you go, oh, I'm doing it too fast. And just with practice, you'll get it, something that you like. Yeah, and if you're getting too much sky in, you'll want to start your blur at the point where you're not seeing any sky and go downward instead of going upward. We'll help you with that. This is on one of Denise's workshops at Chanticleer Gardens, Chanticleer Gardens with a beautiful uh, spring flower bed. I'm using the 180 macro. It's late in the day, so I don't have to worry about an ND filter. I'm probably at an eighth of a second or so. And one of the tricks I love when I'm doing my flowers with the 180 macro, 100 macro, big lens, I'm using my Enduro tripod with the mongoose head, which is a gimbal head. So what I'm able to do is, once I see the framing that I want going this way, I lock the horizontal pan. And I put a little tension on the vertical pan. So now when I go, I'm going to get perfectly straight. This was one of my proudest flower moments. We get to it's beautiful. Uh, Swan Island Dahlia Farm. 
and it's drizzling and it's windy and everybody goes, you can't even do the flower, it's windy and it's raining. So it was raining, so I went on the porch under the overhang and I took the 200 to 400 and I put the teleconverter on and I lined up this clean lower edge is a theme that you see everywhere in all our photographs at Bosky. And it was blowing, so I said, well, let's go to ISO 50 and shoot at F15. It was pr practically dark. And this is an 18 second exposure with the flowers painting themselves onto the sensor. Beautiful. I can't make any flowers, it's too windy. <laughs> Nice. And the Cosmos place, and here's a perfect example of what we're just talking about. This was the Cosmos field by Old Car City. And man, oh man, you, to get that little strip of blue at the bottom took like 100 tries of doing the pan and releasing the shutter, probably an eighth of a second, somewhere in there a sixth. And then I framed the horizontally to get the little red in the corner. Imagine if you put that red right in the middle. Oh, it would be an image killer. I love it. It's beautiful. I, I think like these it. two pictures, if they don't inspire you to try a blur, I don't know what would. <laughs> Blurs are a case of often necessity being the mother of invention. Oh my God! This is this is just quarter or an eighth, and just panning along. And I've seen her do this, and even with me, she's standing there going like this, phew, phew. And every picture's coming out more gorgeous than the next. And everyone else in the group is going like this. And they're looking ugly. <laughs> and then I said, Denise, please do share. Please be specific. And she says, hey, when you do that to get the lines, you got to pan exactly along the rows. Oh, OK. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I just put my AF point on one of the rows, and I just stay right on that row. So it's just quick. You know, however, if I want it on a diagonal, just keep that one on the one row. It's easy. This one I loved. I just, you know what? The colors were, it was blotchy. There wasn't a lot of color. That green represents nothing. And the top part was just empty fields that weren't. But that doing a pan. That one looks awful familiar. Doing a pan just really beautiful. There's so the flame, is a flame blur. blur. So using the type of tool up that kind of looked like a flame to start with, it was just a handheld vertical pan blur. But because I'm hand holding, I just give a little wiggle. <laughs> a little wiggle. So the little wiggle just gets a little bit of movement, you know. I don't want things too straight. Straight's not fun, you know, so a little wiggle. And now I just wiggled a little sideways. <laughs> And oh, yeah. love that one. Now, this is a, a zoom blur, but it, yeah, it is. <laughs> but it's a real slow one where it's just like, you know. And then I've taken it into Photoshop. And have you ever seen in uh, some of those uh, programs, like uh, in Photoshop filters, the accented edges or poster edges, and they add to the edges? If you haven't looked in uh, Photoshop at uh, any of the uh, filters that they have in there, Look at the filter ga gallery and try, and it's only just a little bit, and just gives those little bit of lines to the outside of the flower. And you can also do that in Fractalius or with now Topaz Glow. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.